we are on the top of the hour, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today on our ABB Tech Talks, focusing on electric ferries. I am Priscilla Feister, Marketing and Communications Manager for the Americas, and I'll be your host and moderator for today. Just a few housekeeping notes before we start. I hope you all can hear me okay, but just in case you are having any issues, you can just quickly address it by following the steps showing on your screen. The session will be recorded and available to you after today's presentation. And lastly, but not least, you are all on listen mode only, just to avoid any unnecessary background noise. Now that we have all of those housekeeping items out of the way, I want to go ahead and introduce our speakers for the day. I am here with Bruce Stroop, who leads our ferries segment for the Americas. Bruce has an extensive experience in the maritime industry, over 25 years should be more specific. And during this past 25 years, he has worked in many different roles, including sales, propulsion system and engine product development, business development, strategy development, you name it and Bruce has done it. So prior to joining ABB, Bruce worked at Caterpillar for just over 21 years. He is a graduate of the United States Merchant Marine Academy with a bachelor's degree in marine systems engineering and also held a third assistant engineer's license, unlimited tonnage steam and diesel. And Bruce has also served in the United States Naval Reserve. Thank you for joining us, Bruce. Thanks, Priscilla. Happy to be here. Next, we also have Peter Brin, who leads our technology team. Peter is responsible for designing ABB's pure electric and hybrid marine propulsion systems. His passion for sustainable solutions was recently highlighted in the testimony to the US, US House of Representatives in a hearing called the Path to a Carbon-Free Maritime Industry. Prior to ABB, Peter spent eight years with ExxonMobil's Marine Affiliate. Peter has a master's degree in ocean systems management from MIT and a bachelor's degree in naval architect architecture and marine engineering from Webb Int Institute. Sorry about that. Thank you for joining us, Peter. Thanks, Priscilla. Good to be here. Good. And uh, last but not least, we have John Sosinski, who recently joined our team as a head of engineering and project management, bringing extensive experience in all aspects of project management. John has over 25 years of maritime industry experience, including not only project management, but shipyard management, operations, general management. Oh, goodness. Um, he has successfully managed several technical new build projects in many of the world's largest shipyards. John has a bachelor's degree in marine engineering from the United States Merchant Marine Academy. He has a master's in transportation and logistics management from the American Military Inst University and a master's certificate of applied project management with PMP certification. John is also a US Navy Reserve. <clears throat> so John and Bruce, on behalf of all of us at ABB Marine and Ports, thank you for your service. Our pleasure, Priscilla, thank you. Now, we're going to get started. So, our team typically gets several questions regarding vessel electrification. And what we did here, we decided to just combine all those questions and bring all the answers to you. So, we hope that the information you are about to see is helpful. And if you have questions, I want to continue to encourage you to submit your questions via the chat box um, on the right corner of your screen. So let's get started. Uh, one of the first questions that we typically get, and, and Bruce, I'll ask that question to you. What is electrification and why does it make sense for North American ferry operators? Yeah, thank you, Priscilla. And as Priscilla said, this is a question that we actually get uh, quite a bit. 
And in a, a nutshell, um, marine electrification is the complete or partial powering of a vessel's propulsion plant through either a, an AC or a, a DC distribution system. And, and there are a lot of different ways that, from a technology standpoint, you can do this. And there, there really is no one size fits all solution here. Uh, Peter will touch on this a little bit later on about the, the different technical solutions that are available and how an integrator like ABB would go about sizing those different technical solutions. Um, so, so what are the benefits of marine electrification? And, and there's really four. Um, the biggest one is, is zero emissions operation. Um, in some applications, and in particular ferries um, that have the profile for zero emissions operations, you know, what, what we're looking for are vessels that oper operate in very predictable routes. Um, they're consistently going back to um, the same terminal or, or port, and it's very repeatable. And electrification um, and zero emissions work really, really well there. And when you're able to operate like that in zero emission mode, what we've been able to see is the second benefit, which is a significantly reduced owning and operating costs for the, the vessel owner or operator. Um, we recognize that some of the challenges with electrification right now are that the initial capital investment um, is a little bit more than what we've seen in tra traditional diesel um, propulsion um, arrangements and, and ferries. But that's something that's coming down in price and, and there's a lot of uh, federal assistance and state assistance that's out there and we'll touch on that a little bit later. But really, the reduced owning and operating costs come in when you're taking advantage of energy storage and, and shore charging. And again, Peter is going to go into a little bit more detail a little bit later on in the presentation on uh, the shore charging. But what it comes down to is that a kilowatt of electricity is significantly cheaper to produce on land than it is on the vessel. So if we, as much as we can take advantage of shoreside electricity and powering that vessel, that has a significant impact in reducing, reducing the owning and operating costs for the owner. The third benefit is improved operational redundancy and safety. Um, with a, a DC or AC system um, and a US flag vessel, typically you're gonna have at least two DC distribution systems. And those systems have the op ability to operate in a closed bus configuration. And what that does, it provides a level of, of redundancy and, and safety that you don't typically have in a traditional, a traditional diesel uh, propulsion plant. In a traditional diesel vessel, if you lose an engine, um, that's one whole shaft line that's typically out until you can get that vessel repaired. But in a vessel that uh, has electrification, in particular energy storage, you can actually power both um, buses from one side of the bus. So it just offers a level of redundancy there that's that's not available today in a traditional uh, driveline, uh, diesel driveline vessel. And then the, the fourth benefit is improved operational efficiency. With all this digital technology that's on board these vessels, the, the system is actually able to make real-time intelligent decisions based on all the feedback from all the technology on the vessel to improve operational uh, efficiency much faster um, and, and much more accurately than any human could. So next slide, Priscilla, to kind of touch on what's driving marine electrification right now, there's quite a few reasons, but I just really want to focus on what the top four are. Uh, digitalization. So we've seen significant advances in digital technology shoreside, um, but up until recently, we really haven't seen a lot of that technology make its way into the marine space. And we're really starting to see the beginning of that here in, in North America. We've we've seen that take off in Europe over the past couple of years. And this digitalization wave and the efficiencies um, that it provides a lot of the operators, it, it's really starting to have an impact on owning and operating costs and reducing emissions here in the US. The second one is urbanization. Where a lot of ferries operate tend to be pretty populated areas that already have a lot of heavy traffic, bus systems, trains, and pollution is already a, a concern in a lot of those areas. So if we can embrace electrification in those urban areas and really try to take advantage of the zero emission benefits that are possible with it, it really helps reduce the pollution in urban areas and improve the quality of life. Um, the third one is carbon-free resources. We've seen significant, advance, significant advancements sorry, in battery technology here 
recently. And the more that we see battery technology advance on the shore side, meaning in automobiles, we're going to see those advance, uh, advances transition on the marine side as well. So it, it, there's definite advantages there from a marine standpoint as far as being able to use this new technology, these new, new energy storage, uh, fuel cells fit the, the carbon-free resources. And as those technologies develop and become lower in cost, they definitely make sense for marine applications. And then the fourth one here is the environment. Um, we're seeing a lot of regulatory bodies, we're seeing a lot of governments um, really embrace um, the, the different ways that they can improve the environment in which vessels like, like ferries operate. Uh, Washington State is a, a great example with what they're doing with their Department of Transportation, where they're looking at it holistically and trying to figure out ways where they can reduce their carbon footprint and reduce emissions overall. And, and Washington State and their Department of Transportation have taken a, a huge step there with what they're doing with their, their new build ferries. Thank you, Bruce. The great overview on electrification, the key benefits, and also on the mega trends. And, and you did touch some on the technology aspect of it. So I, I want to throw the next question to you, Peter. So there are many solutions out there. How, so how do they, uh, the customers know which one fits best for their operation? Yeah, thanks, Priscilla. That's a great question. And it's certainly where we start with everybody, whether it's an owner, designer, shipyard, et cetera. Um, th there's a whole portfolio of solutions out there, as you mentioned. We always, of course, start with where have vessels been for the last hundred years, and that's, of course, diesel mechanical, either through a gearbox or direct to a propeller. As we start to step away from that, we've what we've tried to do is sort of take these and put them into buckets of typical design philosophies. So the first of these, what we call case A, is a shaft generator, right? So that's where you have a generator motor in line with the uh, propulsion engine, and it can work either in a power take in PTI mode or power take off PTO mode. And um, this can have some, some of the benefits here, reduced engine hours in particular, uh, and to some degree, uh, fuel efficiency. It's, the the, op, the opportunity is, is somewhat limited in a fuel efficiency area, but there are some opportunities there. Um, in a power takeoff mode, for example, a line haul boat going up the one of the inland rivers that operates for days on end could turn off its generator and power the house and auxiliary loads from the main engine. Power take in mode, you could keep the main engine off, and uh, as you're as you're maneuvering around the port, just use uh, use the use the generator as a motor. Um, you could also sort of uh, do some peak shaving by adding, uh, giving the engine a boost. So there's a couple of opportunities here, um, but but I would say they're fairly limited, and, and it really depends on the operation. Uh, the next step up is a diesel electric arrangement. Now we've seen these particularly on uh, larger vessels, particularly cruise ships, offshore oil and gas vessels, some research vessels, uh, some cable layers, and so there, you know, it tends to work on vessels where there's a high auxiliary or hotel load and and or uh, variable loads, uh, which could be particularly relevant for smaller vessels with a lot of idle time and you can do better load matching with smaller generators. <clears throat> um, and and also uh, in vessels where um, uh, with uh, dynamic positioning, that's more for off the offshore industry. Where we've taken diesel electric, we've gone to what we call KC and that's diesel electric with a battery. So now we've added a battery and that battery can help to optimize the operation of the diesel engine. Now these first three cases are really all what they are trying to improve the efficiency of the diesel engine. When we get into case D, we're looking at um, starting to supplement the diesel uh, engine with another power source. And so case D, we've now taken uh, the diesel electric with battery and we've added short charging. So uh, in the example that Bruce mentioned a minute ago, Washington State Ferries, that's going to be primarily electrically powered, but there's a diesel generator for backup and that falls into this category. The next step, case E, we are looking at all electric. We've eliminated the generators entirely and that's uh, what we're, we've done with Made of the Mist, which we'll be talking about a little bit later as well. And then finally, case F is going to the next step uh, fuel cells. And again, in all three of these cases, we're kind of moving away from diesel and looking at alternative fuels, be it grid power or some form of hydrogen fuel carrier. And uh, probably fuel cells are going to play a bigger, bigger role in large vessels that need to go long distances and have higher power density requirements. 
Um, the next few slides to show this analysis that we'll do with customers and, and we'll work with them to try to get the numbers right. So we'll, we have a tool that will analyze all of these and try to come up with the CapEx, the OpEx, the emissions profile, uh, roughly size equipment. And then once we settle on a direction, we'll really jump into that and really do the design in full. But um, a, this is a typical example of a, a ferry project where we would see and you know, we look at the payback for a, a battery electric design. Again, the next slide, um, you can see a summary of the equipment <clears throat> and a rough footprint to do a footprint comparison. And the final slide shows uh, some uh, an emission comparison. So this is something that we'll uh, often do with partners that we're talking about uh, executing one of these projects and try to find the right solution. Thanks, Priscilla, back to you. Thank you so much, Peter. That, that was great, great overview there. So uh, Bruce, I wanna come back to you. So Peter shared um, several different solutions, right? So uh, an integrator plays a key role in a construction of a new ferry. Can you touch on that a little bit for our viewers? Yeah, sure. So really from an, an integrator standpoint, we, we can break down um, the life cycle of a vessel into to three different phases. You've got the, the front end studies where the, the owner operator is, is considering a new vessel but doesn't quite know what kind of propulsion system they wanna have on board. Maybe they're experienced with diesel mechanical um, and they're very interested about going down the electrification route but they don't know what fits for them. Um, so that would be the, the, first, the first phase. The second phase is, is once a, a owner operator has you know, figured out a design, um, they've been working with a naval architect. They've selected an integrator. Uh, they've identified a, a shipyard, and, and they're they're constructing the vessel, and you know, working to try to get that vessel into operation. And then the third phase is once that vessel has been delivered to the end user, the operator, and that vessel is in operation and forever. How long that vessel operates? We've seen some here in uh, North America that have been in, in service for 50, 60 years, so it could be a long time. Um, an integrator should play a role in all three of those phases. Um, like Peter touched on the analysis that he showed in the previous slides of, of looking at the different technologies, sizing them appropriately, understanding what the, the CapEx and, and the OpEx is. Uh, integrators have a lot of experience in, in that space and whether or not um, as an owner operator, you're working with a, a naval architect or not, an, an integrator can play a, a role in helping you get your head wrapped around what potential solutions are there. And then in the, the project execution phase, when you're finalizing the design and, and working with a shipyard, you know, the, the integrator's got the responsibility for designing, um, supplying all of the equipment, doing all the, the automation from a, a software standpoint, um, making sure that the, the shipyard is able to install and properly do everything necessary to get that uh, integrator provided propulsion system up and running. Uh, the integrator should play a, a significant role in commissioning of the vessel and, and all of the equipment that they're supplying, uh, playing a role in, in sea trialing. Um, and then that third phase, once that vessel is delivered, the integrator has a role there. And I'll be touching on that a little, little bit later on. But if you want to break it into to five different pieces when you're looking at selecting a marine integrator, um, you want to pick an experienced partner. You want to select somebody that has uh, designed these electrification propulsion systems, doesn't just provide one system, but can provide several different options. So you know that you know, they're not trying to push one individual system on you. Uh, they're working with you to understand what your needs are and provide your the best solution that meets your overall needs. Uh, shore charging is important. We haven't really touched on that yet, but Peter will talk a little bit um, in more detail uh, about that later on. But if you really want to take advantage of the, the benefits of electrification, um, shore charging and energy storage are very, very important. And there is no one size fits all solution for shore charging. So working with an integrator that understands what the different solutions are and what the challenges are around shore charging is important. Energy storage. So there's quite a few different battery suppliers out there today. Um, there are significantly less battery suppliers in marine but not every battery is the same. Different suppliers have different areas of expertise that they focus on. Some use different technologies in their batteries and just some batteries are more reliable and durable than others. 
So you want to work with an integrator that has experience in working with a lot of the different battery manufacturers who understands the different battery management systems that are out there. So when it comes to integrating that battery management system into the overall vessel power management system, you've got somebody that's experienced that and has gone through some of those lessons learned. DC grid is important as well. Um, with this electrification wave in marine, a lot of these vessels, especially in the ferry segment, are using a, a DC grid distribution system. And again, Peter will talk a little bit uh, about that. And, and that's important because it, it offers a, a longevity to the vessel. It's an architecture that's very flexible. Um, it's able to incorporate a lot of different um, power sources, whether they be gensets, uh, batteries, fuel cells, or anything else that might come into the future. So it's something that we call future proofing. So being able to utilize a system like that is important. And then the last one is uh, localized service support. And I'll, I'll dig into a little bit more detail on that one later on in the, uh, the webinar. Thank you very much, Bruce. And I know you're gonna to touch um, a little bit more on, on future future proofing the vessels as well. So thank, thank you for um, your notes there. So the next question, uh, Peter, it's going to be for you. So ABB is a strong proponent of electrification and especially battery electric ferries. What are some of the challenges that you see in implementing this new technology? And is the technology really ready for prime time for North America? Yeah, thanks, Priscilla. That's certainly a question we get from folks who are dipping their toe into the to the area. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the short answer is yes, it's certainly ready for prime time uh, in, in the right applications. But let's break it down into a few of the core technologies to really look at sort of the experience level and technology readiness. So when it comes to actual electrification of vessels, uh, well, certainly electri electrification of everything has been around for a while. Electrification of vessels has been around for decades. As I mentioned earlier, it's very common, and particularly on larger ships, cruise ships, offshore oil and gas, research vessels, et cetera. So it's, it's pretty well established technology for certain parts of the industry where it has traditionally made sense, like on, again, traditionally with diesel electric. So there are a lot of reference cases out there. The challenges have come when, when we scale that technology down for inland vessels, for coastal vessels, short sea shipping vessels, the two major technology or there are two major challenges that we run into our cost and space when it comes to electrification um, particularly costs so that the, the DC grid uh, system that Bruce mentioned a minute ago is kind of our traditional uh, technology that we would use where the variable frequency drives would be included and uh, Priscilla if you can show that on the screen you know these these can grow or shrink into different size lineups these systems <clears throat> and you know this is traditionally what you'd have on board a big vessel. Now these can shrink down for smaller vessels, but it can still be a challenge on the size and the cost because they're usually all custom. And we use standard components, but they're all custom engineered for each project can get a little expensive. Um, we have uh, introduced and some of our competitors have similar type products that they're developing a smaller pre-configured uh, solution called onboard micro drive. And this is really geared towards smaller vessels. Now, the challenge is that there are power limitations. So it's really, it has sort of a sweet spot where it operates. Um, and there are some limitations, but by accepting those limitations, we can offer it at a, you know, a much smaller footprint and, uh, you know, more competitive price, which is uh, obviously key for, for smaller vessels. So in terms of electrification, I'd say the experience is there and we're just trying to get those solutions productized. When it comes to the batteries themselves, um, there too is a, a bit of experience already out there. We've uh, seen battery installations on vessels at, to power the main propulsion. I mean, certainly batteries have been on vessels as UPS systems for decades, but to power the main propulsion, we've seen that over the past decade or so, uh, mostly in Europe, we're starting to see it more in North America. The benefit or the opportunity is that the cell cost is coming down as it follows global trends, right? So we're benefiting, we're, we're following the the, uh, the coattails of the auto, uh, the auto industry and utility industry, which are bringing the cost of the cells down. The cost of the modules and the racks that kind of build up the marine system, they're coming down too, although at a slower pace because the, the marine energy, uh, uh, energy storage system integrators that build these marine certified battery systems, uh, their costs come down with scale as well. And of course, the, there is scale growing, but it's in an earlier phase than 
than the auto industry, for example. So the costs are coming down both for the sales and for the integration uh, at different rates. Um, from a weight perspective, I'll say that batteries are indeed, you know, they do have a much lower energy density than certainly diesel fuel does. But what we find is that, you know, most vessels have quite a bit of bunkering capacity. So they may have, you know, 5, 10, 100 tons of fuel capacity on board, depending on the vessel size, to allow them to go two, three, four weeks without bunkering in, uh, in between, you know, bunker uh, times. So because we're only carrying enough energy on board for one or two crossings with a battery system, we actually find that the overall system weight can be comparable, sometimes lighter, sometimes a little heavier, um, depending on the vessel. And, and the owner's needs. So uh, there are challenges, but we've been able to overcome them. And um, Priscilla, back to you. Thank you, Peter, uh, for the good overview there. Um, I, I wanna bring John to the conversation. So John, uh, we're happy that you don't join our team. So welcome aboard and, and uh, official introduction here to uh, all of our viewers. So um, Peter touched a little bit on some of the challenges with those the new technologies and you have over 20 years of experience. I'm, I'm sure you've uh, seen some of the challenges in the past. Can you touch a little bit of that uh, on the integration of this, this new systems and some of the challenges that you've seen on, on some of the projects that you manage? Sure. sure. Um, what's, what's different in the maritime industry as opposed to say automotive, is there kind of a, a factory, you know, one design and, and make a bunch of them to where what we're dealing with in the maritime industry is these are overwhelmingly customized solutions for each vessel to get what they're looking for out of the customer specification. So one example here that we're showing is, this is a one line, uh, one line diagram that my engineering team would look at to, um, to build a, a vessel that's just an energy storage, electrical driven vessel. So we have short charging, a DC bus, energy storage, propulsion motors, and hotel load bus. This is relatively a relatively simple solution with the relatively low number of moving parts. Um, if we go to the next slide, we'll show something that's way more complex. So this is this is a system for a, a, a bigger vessel, which they're gonna have onboard diesel generators to act as, uh, you know, essentially to give them the option of longer range. They have the ability to generate the electricity on board, which will in fall weather conditions or a change in plans, they can um, have the ability to get home. Um, so they have a lot more backups in their system. So it just depends on the requirements of the owner as to how simple our solution can be. So where, where the first one that we showed might be the, you know equivalent to like a Tesla car where it's all battery driven. The second one is demonstrating something that would be more like a, a Chevy Volt which where they have an onboard generator to, once their batteries reach a zero state of charge, they can burn gasoline, or in this case, diesel, to generate electricity to keep them going. So, thanks, Priscilla. Yeah, thank you, John. Good comparison there on the automotive industry. Uh, Peter, I wanna go back to you. So, uh, we touched uh, a little bit on that earlier. Uh, so. Part of the electrification of vessels is the short charging piece. So I wonder if you can touch a little bit on that for um, our viewers here. Sure. Yes. You know, short charging for battery powered vessels uh, is easily overlooked by the operator, but it shouldn't be. Uh, it's not a trivial issue. It can be. It can be a bit of a challenge. Um, the opportunity here, as I said earlier, there are quite a number of installations that have occurred for these battery electric vessels and the, uh, the short charging to support them. So that's good news. Um, and as Bruce touched on before, getting electricity from the grid is, is a big opportunity in these vessels. The challenges, um, so some of the key ones we've seen, one is demand charges, right? And this is where the utility charges additional money for drawing high power rates from the grid. 
What we've seen though, is that for owners that are determined to do this and work with the utility, that the utilities have been fairly uh, responsive and interested in these projects and finding solutions to make them work. So, you know, when we, we say, hey, look, everything about this project works, but the demand charges are just gonna kill the economics, the utility we've seen in several occasions listens up and really wants to be a partner. So, so it is a challenge, but it's one we've been able to overcome in several cases or our partners have been able to overcome. The CapEx associated with shore charging can also be fairly high, especially for the automated systems. Uh, but having said that, the automated systems tend to be for larger vessels. And so as a percentage of the overall project, it usually, while it still may be big dollars, it's still relatively speaking a, a smaller piece, but price can be an issue. Uh, and, and, and the other thing too with price is of course, if you can leverage the same charger for multiple vessels and spread that over a fleet, that's, that's of course beneficial. Uh, although that's not always the case. But I would say perhaps the biggest challenge that's often um, overlooked is arrangements and actually placing the shore charging equipment. What we find is a variety of different you know, berth uh, options. In some cases, there's a, a proper key that the ship comes up alongside and docks against. In some cases for like a double-ended ferry, it may just push into a, a, a wing wall and, and just push in while the cars and passengers uh, come on and off. Uh, or there might be just some pilings and a few dolphins that they tie up to. So depending on the actual infrastructure and trying to avoid putting any new uh, equipment over water, that we, we that will sometimes dictate and drive the solution. Um, but speaking about that arrangement, we'll just go through a few examples. So on the next slide, you'll see some of the traditional, well, I say traditional, I would say the first wave of solutions that we saw, particularly in Europe, where these are larger systems, higher powers up to 10 megawatt range. Um, and this is to charge large ferries that come in with a quick turnaround uh, along the side of the vessel. If that's not an option, there are bow charging options on the next slide and you'll see a few of those. Um, and this is if you have space on, on the car ramp. Um, Priscilla, if you could advance, please, one, one more slide. Yeah, so uh, so this shows the, the bow mounted option so that the ferry can come in and connect there. On the next slide, we see some of the mechanical options. So everything we've seen so far has been automated. So for Made of the Mist, as an example, we use the solution on the right. These would be plug-in solutions, fixed crane. Uh, the crane would simply feed out the, the, the plugs uh, into the socket, and but it's a manual connection. This is good for overnight charging where you only make a few connections a day or for smaller vessels um, where you, you're able to do that in between voyages. And finally, on the next slide, we are working actively, there's an active project within ABB to work with our EV charging team for electric vehicles and try to make those available for marine projects. Uh, this is great because you're using a standardized product used all over the world. You're adopting a global standard that could be used for other equipment in the port as well, as a lot of ports are looking to electrify their, their uh, you know, rolling stock equipment. And, um, and certainly bring the cost down. So, so all of these are being considered and we're happy to explore the right solution uh, with, with, each, uh, with each customer. So thanks, Priscilla. Thank you, Peter. Great overview there. Um, John, I wanna come back to you. Um, and, and we have completed a few uh, vessels uh, here in North America and most recently, one of my favorite projects to promote Made of the Mist. Um, in general, what are the response that you see from customers on uh, finished vessels? Yeah, so I just recently had the opportunity to visit Made of the Mist and um, the, the vessel owners are very happy with the performance of, of the process of going uh, to get electrified. And as well as when you're riding these vessels as the actual cruise passengers, um, in the past, you're gonna be in a situation where you have uh, loud roaring engines, vibration, you have the odor of the exhaust when you're on the top deck, you're getting hit with the smoke, with changes. And that experience is completely changed with this application. So you have vibration free, it's silent, and you have plenty of power to get you where you're going. And it's, it's clean. You're not getting blasted in the face with odors or smoke. Um, so the the whole ride was, was very it was a whole different experience. So um, they're very excited about the direction that it's going in. Hey John, Bruce, a, a follow up question for you. What sure. kind of feedback have you heard from the captains operating um, all electric vessels? 
Good question. What we're finding, yeah, I appreciate that. What we're finding is that um, although in some areas of uh, maritime industry, there's kind of like a little bit of anxiety of, are my captains going to be able to drive this boat? Is it going to be too different of what they're used to? And the actual feedback we're getting from those who have made the transition is that they're basically adjusting typically to two different aspects. The first aspect is where's the horsepower coming from? So instead of it coming from fuel going to a diesel engine and, and ramping up through a gearbox, which causes delay, they're getting a, a almost instantaneous transfer of power from battery to electric motor. So there's a faster response from that respect. Um, the second thing that's very common in these systems is that because of the electrification, it's very common to go to an L drive or a Z drive or an Ozipod, some form of 360 uh, thrust or drive system, which that's a different control system for the captain. So you're basically retraining your muscle memory to have different responses, different situations, because you're using different controls to steer the, the propeller. But the overall feedback we're getting is um, typically about a 30 day, you know, retraining and, and you're off to the races and the captains that have made the switch over, uh, don't see going back to the traditional way of doing things. Or it's just kind of night and day. Thanks, Priscilla. Thank you, John. I'll, I'll continue uh, with you on the line here, and I have another question. So, um, how about class society in the flag states? How are they keeping up with the technology? Can you touch on that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. What we're finding through our projects that we've done so far is the flag state and classification societies are fully aware that this is where the future is going and they're, they've been very proactive on uh, writing guides and new rules that will help the industry implement this technology in a safe and redundant way so that ships can get home um, there's you know things to address as far as fire safety issues with you know when you introduce batteries with the battery chemistry on board and certain things, there's, there's certain things to be addressed for sure. Um, but all of what we've found, all the regulars are, are well on board and very cooperative to make sure that we do implement this technology in a safe way. And one note for vessel owners is that we have to always remember that these rules are written with heavy input from industry. So, if you're uh, a vessel operator that's using hybrid technology or moving in that direction, I would encourage you to, you know, reach out to some of these rulemaking committees, and because they definitely need to receive data on what's going on in the field, so that they understand that the rules that are being made uh, make sense for the industry without hindering operations. Thank you, Priscilla. <laughs> Thank you, John. Great answer there. Um, Bruce, I want to go back to you now and, and talk a little bit about product support. So, you know, we work with the designers and, and we build a vessel, uh, we deliver to the owner. Um, talk about a little bit about uh, product support. Should the integrator play a role in this? And is this an important consideration during the integration, uh, the integrator selection process? Yeah, so thank you, Priscilla. So, um, absolutely. I mean, the integrator is taking the responsibility of essentially um, engineering and automating a, a custom solution designed specifically for that vessel. So they know all the, the ins and outs of that system. Um, there's a lot of software, automation software involved in here, and that's typically designed and modified um, by that integrator. So having the integrator involved as the the vessel ages over time goes into dry dock um, throughout the life of the vessel it's very very important so when you're looking for an integrator you need to make sure that um, that, that integrator has got the ability to, to hang around hang around for what you believe that the life of that vessel to be you also want an integrator that's actually going to be able to to meet your expectations as far as availability is concerned um, if you've got an issue, how quickly are you expecting that integrator to, to have somebody on, on the vessel to help troubleshoot or resolve that issue? 
um, as far as part stock is concerned, is that integrator going to have the necessary part stock close by so that if there's any repair or replacement of components, they'll be able to get it to that vessel quickly. With all the, the digital technology involved with electrification, there, there's a lot of information that's being generated. And if you know how to use it, that integrator can actually um, use that information to do uh, you know, advanced di diagnostics and do some trending over time to determine whether or not there's gonna be any issues with any of the equipment on board. And all of that can be viewed remotely now nowadays. So does a, that integrator have the ability to do any kind of remote monitoring? And are they looking at what's going on that vessel around the clock, meaning 24 seven, 365, is there somebody at that integrator that can pick up the phone and, and call the operator, or the operator can pick up the phone and, and call if there's any issues. Uh, a lot of time, the integrator, you know, they're gonna be providing some equipment that they manufacture and they design, but a lot of times there's third-party equipment that, that's in there as well. Does that integrator have the relationship with those third parties uh, to be able to meet the expectations of that end user? Uh, life cycle support. So again, over the life of the vessel, um, a lot of this equipment, it's new technology and much like your phones, that technology is gonna evolve very quickly. Does that integrator have the ability to keep up with that evolution and be able to offer different solutions, um, you know, maybe more efficient solutions to you over time? And then the last one is sustainability. Um, this digital front that we're in right now, there's going to be a lot of software solutions coming forward that allow for safer and more efficient operations. You know, you want an integrator that's, you know, keeping track of those trends and, and is able to bring you ideas as you move forward that allow you to, to better serve your customers, um, you know, provide training for, for your operators uh, and just make your, your operation more safe and efficient over time. Thanks, Priscilla. Yes, thank you, Bruce, that was great. Um, John, I wanna come back to you on uh, construction of vessels. So are you finding that uh, this, this uh, new technology is requiring different construction methods at the shipyard level? And how does EBB support shipyards and the adoption of new technologies in, in general? Yeah, so yeah. the overwhelming skill sets that are required to build a ship really don't change so uh, you know similar welding methods block hole construction crane lifts placement all of that is going to be similar the thing the areas where you really benefit is when you eliminate the shaft line if you go to a an electric propulsion with say a 360 thruster um, you can eliminate the shaft line you can move the you know different machinery around to where you want the weight to make makes sense as far as a naval architect perspective and Put it in the space where it fits rather than making sure it's in line with the shaft so that's an advantage the some of the challenges is since there is a lot of electronics and high voltage wiring and stuff like that there needs to be um, smart placement of all of those things so um, so that between the high voltage wiring and automation you're not getting harmonic noise interfering with certain controls um, so that is an issue to work through and what we're finding too is that there's an extra consideration to be made because you're it, if you have a plug-in system a short charging system you essentially have a second project that needs to align in parallel with your vessel project because you can't commission your vessel until the short charging is complete and vice versa so but as a whole um overwhelmingly nothing earth shattering it's similar shipyards we found can be set up to build these vessels Thank you, John. Uh, Bruce, I want to come back to you. Um, are those new electric ferries more expensive? And what are the sources of funding at the federal and state uh, level that are currently available to offset the potential uh, additional CAPEX? You are on mute, Bruce. I knew there was going to be somebody that did it and it had to be me. <laughs> so I think Peter touched on this early on, uh, that one of the challenges right now with this technology and its adoption in the marine space, are the, the CapEx that's uh, 
um, initially required for, for new vessel construction or, or for repowers. And, and Priscilla, can you go to the, the next slide, please? There we go. So what, and, and the, the US government has recognized this and they wanna drive this new technology um, in areas where it makes sense with ferries being in one of them. So there are, well, there is quite a bit of funding available from the, the US federal government. So the, the Federal Transit Administration has um, funding available for ferry new construction and, and repower. Um, that, that funding is, is tied to um, Buy America requirements and those requirements can be a little bit complex to understand, but essentially 70% uh, of the, the cost of construction of the vessel, um, those materials have to come from um, US manufactured sources. And there are some exemptions there, but it takes a little bit to understand what those are. Uh, the Federal Highway Administration's got funding available under Buy American requirements and they are different than by America. Um, again, there's uh, exemptions there that are a little bit more friendly towards electrification than uh, the by America requirements, but it does take some understanding of that. Uh, MARAD, the US Maritime Administration has funding available. Um, Department of Energy has funding available and, and it's not just for the vessel. It's also for a lot of the, the terminal infrastructure work that might be necessary um, in order to accommodate these uh, electric vessels. A lot of states have funding available. Um, every state in the United States receives some money from the, the Volkswagen settlement. Um, and that money can be used by the states however they see fit, but it does take some lobbying on uh, operators' behalf to make sure that uh, they can get some of that money earmarked for them. And then I know a lot of other uh, states in the, in the U.S. have grants um, and organizations in place uh, that are trying to promote electrification in the marine space and in particular ferries. And then to try to get, get your heads wrapped around what opportunities are that are out there, because it is kind of a, a complex um, network, there are grant agencies out there that, you know, this is their sole purpose in life and this is how they make money by helping operators find grant funding that's available to, available to them for, for new vessel or, or terminal infrastructure work. And, and what I've tried to do is the, the website down at the bottom of the page is a, a pretty good location that the EPA has where they can track of all the uh, marine related uh, funding opportunities that are either at a federal or a, a state level. So. Uh, there's quite a bit out there and they do a pretty good job of, of keeping that up to date, but I know it isn't all inclusive, but that's the, the single best location I've found so far. And I want to apologize to anybody on the, the call from Canada. Uh, I'm not that familiar right now with any um, subsidies or grants that the Canadian government or any of the provinces have in place. So that's something that we're going to work on here in the near future and we'll have some more information on that moving forward. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Bruce. And um, uh, we, we covered a lot of topics here, but I know that there are a lot of questions coming through and I'm going to bring in our, um, there you go, Dave Lee, our um, team member to help us address some of those questions. So Dave, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you, Priscilla. Um, guys, good job here. Um, had a lot of good questions come in. We still have some continue to come as well. I uh, feel like I'm on uh, election night here as all these results keep coming in. So uh, let's kick it off. Uh, first, for all the attendees, uh, we're going to try to get as many questions as possible here. If we're not able to um, I'm, we have a, a list started and we'll follow up later uh, with all the, uh, the answers. So first of all, let's let's go ahead and kick off some a couple of the private messages I receive. Um, and uh, let's see, Bruce. Um, question is, does ABB manufacture their own batteries? So the answer to that question is no, we, we do not. Um, we work with a lot of different manufacturers in this space because there is, uh, depending on what your application is, whether it's a, a power dense application, whether you're looking for something that um, provide short bursts of power or something that you want endurance for. There, there's a lot of different designs of, of batteries out there right now that can provide those level of capabilities. So instead of ABB, you know, designing our own batteries that, that can do that, we, we've decided to just work with the existing manufacturers in this space uh, to be able to meet what our customer needs are. There's also 
preferences around water cooled or, or air cooled batteries. And uh, yeah, it'd, be, it'd be very tough for us to meet all of our customer needs if we decided to have an ABD branded battery that tried to do all that. So just trying to meet our needs by working with third parties that uh, are developing those solutions already today. Great. Sounds great, Bruce. Uh, let's see, let's go to uh, another one. And, and I know this is discussed quite a bit, especially on uh, things like fast ferries. So, um, Peter, cost and weight are still very high for smaller vessels, and it's a barrier to vessels wanting to move to hybrid or even make the first steps into this realm, right? So, question is really two parts. How is this best uh, addressed? And are there smaller battery packs or different systems um, that should be considered for things such as uh, fast ferries? Yeah, great question. So I guess the, to the first question of how is it addressed, I would just say very creatively. So it's it's a bit of a give and take process with the operator to understand what's acceptable. Uh, for example, we may have presented to us a requirement for a certain amount of shore charging, and we would respond, look, if you can relax that from you know, 1.2 megawatts down to say 900 kilowatts or something, then we can, for example, use our onboard micro drive or something like that if you can. So it'll be a little bit of a give and take sometimes to see if we can optimize on a solution that fits the the micro drive solution as an example, which is smaller, lighter, and more cost effective. Um, and then I, I will confess there's probably an area where I, th there are then also some manufacturers of more like outboards, uh, you know, like more for the recreational boating market, like Torquedo and some other companies like that. And I've sometimes deferred folks to, I said, sorry, your application's just too small for us. It's not going to work. You know, you might want to look at one of those folks. Um, and there is kind of a range that's a little too big for Torquedo and a little too small for us, I confess, where it is a challenge sometimes. We still have conversations with folks and see if we can find a solution. But And I'd say more often than not, we can. But, um, but it can be a challenge. As far as fast ferries on the second question, I agree. I would say fast ferries and particularly like longer overnight cruiser type vessels that have maybe, uh, well, like I say, an overnight route, um, that, can, that can push the limits of what batteries can practically do. And in those applications, we are advocating for fuel cells, but of course, the, and we are actively working with fuel cells, but uh, it is a newer technology, more expensive, and does have more challenges. We, we just didn't have the time to cover them today, but we certainly would have, have in other tech talks. Great. Thank you, Peter. I'm going to stick with the, uh, the kind of the battery conversation, then we'll move on after this last question. And John, um, I'm going to ask this one to you. Uh, I know you've spent a lot of time uh, with uh, projects such as the Made of the Mist and our battery manufacturers. So the, the question here is, how are the batteries controlled to avoid thermal runaway while overcharging or overheating? There's an incoming fault. Um, can they be overcharged, overheated? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple different ways, which my answer probably isn't going to be 100% all inclusive, but the basics are this. Now, there's a step to separate each individual cell from its adjoining cells. So you want to wrap it in in a uh, basically a you know a fire retardant layer to separate it from adjacent cells. So that's one of the items, and then. We have water cooled and air cooled. So controlling the overall environment of the space that the batteries are in is extremely important. And then the automation to actually separate the system when there is a, a thermal event is a next step of control. And then the last um, control system is when you do have a thermal runaway, you're gonna have gases that are produced from that thermal runaway. And it's about controlling the gases that are being emitted. So what you're going to find in a lot of these marine battery systems is you're going to have actually like a, a an exhaust gas chamber um, attached to the back of the rack. So that there's like a blister pack that'll break that gas that's being, you know, that 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 module is going to want to expand with the gases that are coming out of that one cell that's overheating. So it can go into that through that blister pack into an exhaust to leave the battery space. So you're not putting um, harmful gases in the battery space, both for the humans and also to dissipate the heat, so you're not overheating adjacent cells. Great. If, if I if I could just add two two more to that, uh, John, that sure. was a great overview. I, if I could expand on the automation piece, 
the battery the batteries providers have a battery management system that actively monitors the cells and the modules, the temperatures and, and uh, currents and whatnot. And that system is principally responsible for, you know, ensuring that everything's working properly and that you're not going to have a runaway. That also is communicating with ABB's power and energy management system, because up in the wheelhouse, of course, the skipper's, you know, asking for power. And, uh, and and so that system is responsible for meeting the uh, requirements of the battery with the requirements coming out of the wheelhouse and making sure everything's okay. And then the final, I, I agree with John, it's a layered approach. The final layer, of course, is the, the FIFI, the firefighting protection in that actual space. So in addition to the exhaust management, uh, you'll have a requirement for you know, a certain, uh, A, the battery room needs to be separated its own space and B, it needs to have its own firefighting protection. Wonderful, thank you, Peter. Um, and just another note for all those that are attending, um, at any point, uh, there is more questions or I butchered the questions that were answered, feel free to reach out to any of us on our email it's on the screen now. So let's move to a, a, a different realm um, when we talk about electrification. We, let's talk about fuel cells for just a second here, Peter. So this one's for you. Uh, fuel cells look like a low efficient way to electrify vessels. However, energy density is still a challenge for batteries. Which is the max? Which is the maximum range where batteries are the best option? How's the trend uh, for this maximum range? Do you consider uh, it could be possible to extend considerably, or do you see a limit? Um, so I'm just going to leave it there, Peter, and, and kind of let you go on, on fuel cells. I right? think the question summarized it really well. Um, it's true, but so my my our first approach is always: can we make batteries work? Um, the the question was absolutely right. The energy efficiency from we used to say well to wheel, I like to say propeller to propeller, the propeller, the, uh, the wind farm to the propeller of the vessel, right? What's the overall efficiency? And as we look beyond our own, our own North America, if we look globally and look at the maritime industry globally and think about container ships and you know, bulkers and others, um, globally, we're talking about hundreds of gigawatts worth of new power to be able to power these vessels to replace fossil fuels, right? So. That's a substantial. So when you talk about 5% efficiency gain here and there, that's another 50 power plants that may not need to be installed. So I think the industry overall is looking at that and the efficiency needs to be considered when settling on these solutions. Now getting back down to our, our scope, um, because of that, yes, the efficiency matters very much, the energy efficiency, and it's much higher with batteries. And so we try to make it work wherever we can. I don't have a really I don't have a firm answer for your question of how far it really depends on the project. You can have a long distance, but if you have continuous operation, then maybe the bigger battery pack justifies itself. Um, it, it just it just depends on the project. So I don't have a, a great answer for that. But generally speaking, I'd say within a harbor or regionally, not very far from a harbor is where you're looking and, and where batteries make sense and where you have repet repetitive operation, meaning you're charging multiple times a day because there you're making the money back every time you charge because you're saving as opposed to diesel. Um, you know, and, and yeah, so fuel cells, and if that, if we can't make that work, then we look at fuel cells as, as a solution. But I think the question summarized the, uh, the situation quite well. Wonderful. And, and Peter, if I can maybe just add on that, typically any vessel that has fuel cells on it is also going to have batteries on it. Um, just because fuel cells do take a, a little bit of time to, to ramp up and, and take the load. And, and, and in order to cover that, um, you need some batteries or energy storage on board um, to not lug the, the fuel cell down. So it's it's not either going to be a battery or a fuel cell. Fuel cells will have batteries on board. Yep. Great point, Bruce. Yep. All right. So again, for all the attendees, I apologize. We're we're quickly running out of time here. We have plenty more questions to answer, but again, we'll, you'll receive a link to all the Q and A uh, following the session today. I have one last question to all panelists. Uh, so and I'm just gonna go straight down the, the road here. Um, so Bruce, to you, are electric ferries the new standard in North America? Yes, absolutely. Mr. John. No question. Peter. You know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say that the uh, the numbers are still small, but with the indication we get, and that's just because we're at the very start of that S curve. But yeah, I think we're absolutely in the beginning of a big ramp up. So I'd, I'd uh, like to definitely say yes. Wonderful. Okay, Priscilla, that's it for Q and A. I'll, I'll hand things back over to you. 
Thank you so much, Dave. Um, we, I have a few announcements before we close this uh, webinar. I hope you guys enjoyed and, and we answer uh, a lot of the questions, but again, just to confirm what David mentioned, just please reach out to some of our guys if you have any additional questions. Um, we talked about a lot uh, on shore connection during this call and we, we covered the marine side of that and we'll have uh, specific tech talks coming up on December 9th that is going to cover the land side of it. So just want to encourage you guys to uh, register for that as well. And then last but not least, uh, you will be redirected to a quick survey. Just let us know how we did uh, after this webinar. Um, this concludes the ABB Tech Talk session for today. I want to give a special thanks to Bruce, John, and Peter for joining us. Um, today and um, everybody have a great day and stay safe out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Appreciate it.